Hi, I'm Charles Martinet, and you're listening to Scene World Podcast. Scene World Podcast. It's June. It's 2015. I'm AJ. He's York. What's happening? Hey. Well, what's happening? I'm actually sitting here, staring at the monitor, looking at AJ, and thinking like, wow, is it almost one year since our first podcast already? Yeah, yeah, it has been almost one year. So many nice guests so far. This month is no different. We have um, the legendary... Captain Crunch, John Draper. Yeah, you know, he comes to Mannheim a couple of times. And uh, the last one was June 2012. And the, this is another time, 2015. And he actually is on his trip throughout um, Europe. So, and he stopped by Germany, Mannheim too. So mm -hmm. I got the pleasure of um, picking up on Saturday um, night and actually spending a whole Sunday with him and Monday evening. That was very nice. Mm, very cool. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we used that possibility to actually sit down with him on a couch, some ice cream, <laughs> and um, have a conversation. Yeah. Um, so first things first, before we get into that... Before we start the conversation with John, let's go over some uh, some old stuff, some previous things. Um, this paper actually does have things written on it, unlike last last month where I just pretended. Uh, yeah. So we hinted at the possibility of expanding into some different areas. Um, last month was our first video podcast, which was with with uh, your own tell and Tess Fries, and that was pretty cool and. We've been thinking about doing some stuff with video and, and, and some live streaming for a bit now. And, uh, well, York has just finally set up and figured out how to use Twitch. So we will be doing something with Twitch. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, so we will, we will doing this with Oliver Six, you know, from, um, D Lock. And so this will be like a three way, live um, video podcast thingy about special C64 gaming topic, but I really don't want to spoil the surprise here, but this will be something unique, I hope. And uh, HA will be the moderator. I'll be there babbling nonsense. Yep, yep, that's true. And actually, um, on, um, on the museum project, you know, that will start soon. What, what's the museum project? Well, that's the Frankfurt, Frankfurt um, Film Museum thing, right? And they are having they are having a program, film and games, and this film and games event will be from um, well from end of June till January, and as I said in the last podcast, on every last Wednesday in the month, I will be on a Twitch show. From 6 to 8 p.m. European summertime. And our first guest will be Chris Hulsbeck. That's pretty nice. awesome. That is cool. Yep. Because he will be in that area at that time. So we will talk about, um, well, his history, what he's doing on a pro broader scale. And so this will be happening on Twitch. Um, this will be Twitch dot tv dash olymptronica we'll put a link to this in, in in the podcast description yes so and we will be mirroring that to our scene world a uh, twitch channel mm -hmm. that will be twitch.tv um slash scene world and we have to figure out how to do that so you should go there we'll and up. yeah you, sh you should all go to twitch dot TV slash scene world and subscribe to our channel and, and check out for notifications and stuff so that you know when we're, yeah. 
when we're on there doing stuff, it's going to be um, it, it's a it's a whole new new realm we're we're kind of experimenting with. And I've seen the software, and it's incredibly difficult. So I'm leaving most of it I to just, York because I, I, <laughs> because it, well, it, it terrifies me. You are joking. Actually, it's pretty pretty easy. It buckled my mind how easy it is. So I thought like, okay, this is why everybody is being on Twitch nowadays because it's so easy to set it up, you know? And we thought about, you know, this is also partially brought up by the fact that we're, we're part of this extra life, um, charity campaign with, uh, uh, we're part of the Frag Dolls team and, uh, the, the game day where you, you're pretty much supposed to, kind of game for 24 hours sort of i mean there's there's lots of there aren't too many rules in how you do it but uh game day is november 7th and we were sort of trying to figure out a way that we could that we could use that and 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 do something with that and twitch really gives us a place that where we can we can do that and we can switch off and 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 over the course of 24 hours on november 7th we'll be doing playing games and and goofing around and being idiots and and so you can check our check out our pages on there, uh, extralife.org slash participant slash nafcom for Jurg. Uh I'm extra-life.org slash participant slash AJH. Um, I've already gotten some donations. Uh, I'm 10th out of 14th in, on, in team rank in, in donations, so I'm, I'm pretty jazzed by that, and I have no idea who any of the people that gave me donations are. So thanks, everybody, but I wish you'd let me know who you were so I could thank you on here. Yeah. And speaking of Extra Life, we are on the Frag Dolls team. And while we're talking about the Frag Dolls, because we have seemed to be something new has been happening with the Frag Dolls almost every month since we spoke to them. And now that's not going to happen anymore because Ubisoft has, has, um, shut down the Frag Dolls. Yep. That's pretty sad. So the, the website, I, I would say go to go to their website and check them out, but there there is no website. The website's already been taken down. The YouTube <laughs> channel no, still exists. Question is for how long? Because Twitter is offline, the homepage is offline. You actually should go to the um, YouTube yeah. thing, and um, I I will I will definitely um, send that link to Chris so he can put it on our site as a link because Seltzer was doing. A very very nice goodbye video containing all the past frag dolls from the last ten years, including what 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 they are doing nowadays. And it's interesting. Like ninety nine percent of them actually got careers in IT or gaming business. Right. That's pretty awesome. Yes, it is. Um. Well, AJ, let's see what our place will be in ten years. We've been doing this for ten years already. Yeah, well, yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, yeah, it's true. Actually, 14 years. We are doing this 14 years, the Steamworld brand already, which is kind of interesting because when I, when, when, well, when we started it, it was like, will it be successful? Well, yeah, I don't know. So it's, and, and, and you know, I, I still had that same sort of feeling, uh, even up until maybe a, a year or two ago when, things that really kind of blew up i mean we, we, we are doing issue we are doing issue 25 when when i'm calling people like oh seal world i've seen that magazine pretty pretty good stuff you know i'm like wow seriously you know you've seen the magazine you know i mean i'm not talking about the senior i'm talking about people like chris craig from epics mm -hmm. or you know People who who really watch the scene a little bit, you know, and then saying, well, "Wow, it's pretty cool what you're doing there," and um, you know, a disc magazine in 2015. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. And um, actually, right now we are working on expanding a bit our audience by offering it on 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 our homepage without having Vice emulator installed on your PC. Um, so we're talking but, about actually that. being able to, yeah. actually being able to wa look at the magazine, read the magazine, and view it, and all that stuff in in the web browser without having to download a disk image or learn how to use a, a an emulator or anything like that. Yeah, that's we're, actually we're, true. So where are we with that right now? Well, he the coder said he has some free days in June and it should be ready by Gamescom. Okay, let's hope that's going to happen. 
When, and now Gamescom. You're going to be at Gamescom. When is Gamescom? So Gamescom is happening in Cologne, Germany. And it actually grew so big since last year that it's now the biggest games fair in the world. Until last year, it was the biggest one in Europe. And now it's the biggest one worldwide. And it's from the 5th to the 9th of August. While the 5th is a business day for business and school classes. Mm. And the other days are for visitors. And you'll be and wandering about there. You'll, you're going to have a booth there, actually. Yes, yes. We will be teaming up with Hans Highscore, okay. which is um, a group of musicians that do um, retro game music mm -hmm. on modern instruments. And we will also be there with a little staff that includes me, of course, and Gary, mm -hmm. Scorpion, mm -hmm. and Arthur Van Damme, which is TMC. Mm -hmm. So we will be three of the staff. And actually, we will have a special interview at Gamescom. And I actually already checked it out from the technical standpoint. Um, that means um, our August podcast will actually be happening at a recording at Gamescom. But, of Sweet. course, I don't want to spoil the price here. It will be a very special topic. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. You you are telling me what's going on, and I was saying, well, it's special. I don't want to say details. So, yeah. So, you see, yeah. there are some things coming ahead, and it's really, really a pleasure to to say that hopefully you like that because it's really not easy to organize all that stuff. That's pretty interesting because I always say from the outside, it looks like, you know, doing the magazine, ah, simple. Doing video interviews, simple. Doing podcasts, simple. But it's not so simple, actually. I've, I've used the Voodoo things. Editor. Nothing, none of that is easy. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I'll take, yes. I'll take audio editing over, over uh, the Voodoo Editor any day. Well, so, so you'll be at Gamescom. Um, yep. In Cologne, and you will be, and at I will be event. at at a video game con. That's what it's actually called, a video game con. It's, uh, it's you can find the the page at avideogamecon dot com. It's September nineteenth in Parsippany, New Jersey. I don't know what I'm going to be doing there. I, we don't have a booth or anything. I'll just kind of be wandering around and 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 I, I imagine harassing people. And you know, I'll, I'm going to try to take somebody with me so I can get some some filmage and some audio and, and whatnot, but I'll be walking around sporting the Scene World t-shirt and, 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 Handing and out business cards. Yep. And, and, and the special hand stamp, the Scene World hand stamp. So come get your hand stamped. If you have any desire to, to find me at this thing. Yeah. Look, so I, I'll, be, yeah, I'll, be the, I'll be the, I'll be the, there. I'll be the tall guy scowling in the corner. Yeah. And Billy Mitchell announced on the Richie Knuckles show on Twitch that he will be there for sure. Yeah. Cool. Oh, so, hi, famous people. Scene World, Rich, Billy Mitchell will be there. Yeah. The Donkey Kong, big player, the Pac Man. So, so should we talk uh, about, um, before we get into things, should we talk about uh, Dave Lowe, Uncle Art? Yes. So, out of the regular um, release schedule, I, we actually released last month a video interview with Dave Lowe. And talking when we, about, we actually, yeah. he was running a Kickstarter. And, yes. Um, when we were talking with, with your own tell and test rise last month, um, it was like right before, like a day before that, that, the Kickstarter had failed for them. Yeah. For, and it was Dave just 1000 short as right. said previously. Mm -hmm. And now it's back actually. Yeah. They're giving it another shot. They're relaunching it. Yep. Second try. Dave Lowe and his daughter, Holly Jaslo. Yep. It's called Uncle Art, a temporal shift. So you can look it up on Kickstarter. Uh, we will link to it in the description. Um, but it is Uncle Art, a temporal shift in which they are releasing all his, well, mainly arca arcade conversions for home computers and consoles. Right, because Dave Lowe was, was the, yeah. right, cause he was the guy that pretty much did music conversion back in the day. Like almost like, like the most, I mean, you know, Street Fighter 2, Power Drift, Elite 2, Star Glider, which was not a co conversion, but anyway, it should, we should mention it. Afterburner. Afterburner's got some great music. Oh, yes. He did awesome work on Afterburner. 
it's amazing. And he did Ikari Plus for the Amiga. Okay. And at that time he did that music, he told me he didn't even know that Rob Hubbard did it, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So they are working on it. It's an album, I, I suppose. It's a... Yep. It's a remaking with the with full orchestral recordings and everything at, at Abbey Road Studios. And so they've, they've re- relaunched this. Uh, currently it's got about 31 days to go. We've got a whole month. I, I guess it just relaunched now. And, uh, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. And we've already, we've already got a bunch of backers and have, have gotten a decent chunk towards this. But anything would help and it would be great to see this, this happen. So go to that page. Uncle Art, a temporal shift. Uh, we'll link to it, so you should definitely. And Jay will get his vinyl edition, even though he doesn't have a record player. <laughs> they're, they're they're offering a vinyl. They are yeah, offering a vinyl. a vinyl. Holy crap! Look at that. They're offering a vinyl. Okay, so getting along now, we have Captain Crunch, John Draper, the one and only. He is legendary. He is well he known. Is the... Author of Easy Rider, mm-hmm. which was the first word processor with, with a proportional font and for the Macintosh. Yeah. Right, right. And and um, and, and he phone is, freaking. Right, phone freaking. He's the inventor of the blue box. Involved in the in the early early Apple days with uh, working on on phone cards for the Apple, and uh, he's done a lot of stuff. And he is sitting on the couch next to York. And the special thing about him is actually that um, as a teenager, I read the books from Efren Zen that actually mentioned his career and his past life and his pioneering in that um, IT computer electronics area. And as a teenager, I was like 16 at that time, I always dreamed about talking once to Captain Crunch. And right now, well, I met him a couple of times in my life. So this is very special to me. And um, so he is known for phone freaking and also for inventing the Easy Writer. And... The special thing about him is that he has a very, very big knowledge about about security, about encryption, and all that kind of stuff. So he's really, really, very knowledgeable and a pioneer in that area. And he also thought about ways how to improve our lives, how to make it more secure, how to improve communication and society. So, let me introduce to you Captain Crunch. And I'm very pleased to say that I spent the weekend with him. And he's actually sitting right next to me because he did his visit in Mannheim. Hello, Captain Crunch. How was your trip throughout Europe? Uh, it was a little bit harrowing. Um, I'm not quite used to the cold weather. I come from very hot Las Vegas. Going from hot Las Vegas to very cold uh, um, Stockholm, Sweden, was a little bit of a shock to my system, I must say. I can imagine. Um, so tell us a bit, John. You are actually having your name from this um, cereals. Captain Crunch thing? Well, yeah, it's a whistle, and it, the whistle is basically a, uh, a little toy whistle. It comes inside a Captain Crunch cereal box, as most American cereals will often have a little prize inside. Captain Crunch is no exception, and inside there is this whistle, and it just so happens that this whistle toots at a certain frequency that can activate certain telephone company equipment, that can cause us to get, uh, you might say, root-level access into the phone system. And how did you figure that out? I didn't. The blind kids did. <laughs> I completely am not that guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so they figured out that it had the right the right tone for um, 
Yeah, they had to glue one of the holes because when you blow the whistle, you usually get two tones, and you have to put a finger o- over the hole mm-hmm. um, that that uh, just only lets that one tone in, and it's the twenty six hundred tone, and it's very close to the the frequencies that uh, the phone companies used to use for hanging up phone calls, and so one of the pranks the blind kids used to do is they go to the airport and there's all these banks of payphones and everybody's on these payphones they're all making long distance calls and he goes and they go wander down that hallway blowing that whistle and disconnecting all those business people from their <laughs> business calls because that was how effective the whistle was in disconnecting you from a call wow so just that one frequency can just blow off your calls do you actually know how the blind kids figure that out what they, uh, they were, uh, they had perfect pitch. And so it wasn't long before somebody, one of those blind kids must have gotten their hands on a Captain Crunch whistle and discovered that, hey, this is a frequency that the phone company uses. And they started dialing up numbers and blowing the whistle into the phone to see what happens. And through trial and error, they've been able to uh, discover that the whistle drops them into certain trunks and they could then pulse the whistle, like if you pulse it three times to dial a digit three, pulse it one time to dial a digit one, you could dial numbers that way. And so uh, that was uh, before the the advent of blue boxes or before the phone company switched it to multi-frequencies instead of single frequencies. Single frequencies was 2600. Multi-frequencies are the combination of two tones which make one digit. So you have... 16 tones that can give you 16 digits of which um, 10 of the digits are 1 through 10 and uh, or actually 0 through 9 and then uh, there's other tones that you have to do for opening the tone you have to dial a number and then you close the tone so you, you open it dial a number close it so that way the trunks can take receive three digits uh, Three-digit numbers, five-digit numbers, ten-digit numbers, of course, seven-digit numbers, and six-digit numbers. And so you have to know how many digits the trunk has to take. Another way to know that is to open it up and close it and put it between the two tones. It seems kind of complicated, but it, it, it worked, and, and, and you were able to... Um... Yeah, very well. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a, there's a, a, a legend that I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard and, and, and lots of people have said about you calling up uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, yeah. Um, let me kind of lead up to the story. Um, I was scanning 800 numbers in Washington, D.C. I wanted to get and record every single 800 number that would wind up and terminate in Washington, D.C. Why Washington, D.C.? Because U.S. government is in Washington, D.C., Lots and lots of government offices in Washington, D.C. Lots and lots of people, organizations in Washington, D.C. that might have a special number that's toll-free. Well, I just brute forced the entire 10,000 numbers and got every single one of them. One of them was 800-424-9337. It was just an innocent number. I got... uh, I called the number, and a person answered. Was very rude to me. And why would anybody be rude when they're paying for your call? That didn't make sense to me. So it took me a few minutes to think about how I could let this guy know that I, I want more information from him. So I went and I um, I told him that I was the phone company. And we're having some problems with their phone. Can you please tell me who we've reached? And at that point, they would give us the information that it was the White House CIA crisis hotline number. Oh. And that number, if you knew the right code word, would get you the president. And this was dying 1974. Uh, president Nixon was having his problems in the White House with Watergate, among other things. So he couldn't be further from having the really good attitude. (laughs) So we decided to punk him. We pranked him. We called him up. We told him we were out of toilet paper. That was a national emergency. (laughs) 
Of course, he wasn't too happy about that. We didn't stick around to find out just how happy he was. We hung up pretty quickly because we knew that it would take a little bit of time for them to trace the call, but uh, probably not as much as I would have hoped. So uh, they didn't trace it back to me, thank God. <laughs> but uh, I kept it pretty quiet for many, many years. And, and then when I, in the mid-'90s, when I opened up my website, webcrunchers.com, that's when I put that's when I put the story up online on my website. So it's not just a legend, it actually it actually happened. As far as I can tell, yes, but I wasn't the one talking to the president. Uh, I had a friend do that. Oh. But the fact that the, the fact that the, the story existed, somebody talked to the president and it was an, it was a voice that we definitely identified as Nixon. <laughs> He's got a very unique voice. So yeah. it, we uh, we're pretty sure it was Nixon. These days, if you tried that, you'd have SWAT teams crashing through your windows within minutes. <laughs> yeah, within seconds, even. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, the phone system today is quite a bit different than the phone system back then because there was no caller ID back then. Even right. if you had an 800 number, you're, you're entitled to knowing the phone number of the person calling you, and that information is instantly stored, whereas opposed if you have your phone number and somebody calls you, that person's phone number will not be recorded on your equipment. Only if you have an 800 number right. will you know who calls you because that's how the phone company bills you for those incoming calls. You have to know where the calls are coming from so they'll know how to bill you because if the calls are coming from out of band, then the phone company will know not to try to switch it through because you have different bands of 800 numbers. Band 1, I think, is all the neighboring states. Band 2 is the neighboring states that neighbor those, and Band all the way up to band five, and band five is the whole country. And so with that, you're able to, uh, we were able to find Washington, D.C.'s 800 numbers. And we found a lot of very interesting stuff in there. We found computer access numbers. We found, uh, I mean, we didn't try any of them because we didn't have a terminal at the time I was playing around with this stuff. But uh, we, we got numbers that ended and ended, answered with a dial tone. We started dialing numbers on it. We figured out that we can contract we didn't know who it belonged to. We could make long distance calls on it, no, but it could no. be could belong to some other government agency. We yeah. wouldn't stick around to find out either. All right, no. We figured that any, playing around with those numbers would probably be pretty pretty bad. Yeah. So we were careful. I mean, we we would do this from pay phones that or phones that couldn't be traced to us. We'd often uh, call them to another watts extender. So when we call them. Uh, we're not actually calling from a number. We're calling from a different number. So we were careful to, to kind of erase our tracks as best we could. We didn't go out of our way to erase our tracks, just enough to stay out of their reach. Do you think that kind of thing could be done today? Uh, I highly doubt it today. A lot of these numbers now have instant instant caller ID. They know right right where you're calling from. Within seconds, they could get your location if you got a call from a cell phone, mm -hmm. and probably be accurate to within ten meters. So yeah, it's pretty not not a very safe thing to do with cell phones is to harass government agencies because <laughs> they'll know who you are, they'll know where you are, they'll know what phone number you're calling from, they know the provider you're using. And uh, all in all, they'll know everything about you before you can even think about knowing about yourself. There's a lot of... Um... So and that, that brings me to another really important thing. And I always want to try to... Whenever I give talks, I always want to try to stress computer privacy and security. How to keep out of the radar of the NSA. That's, that's actually... I wanted to ask you about that because there's a yes. lot of stuff happening now the with... Very the very important thing you have to remember, if it's text you want to send to somebody, like an email, point-to-point -point encryption. That means you download PGP for your iPhone or your iPad, and you build a key or you import the key from your key ring. I usually keep my keys in an actual physical key ring on a, on a thumb drive. So I have all my keys on a thumb drive, and it's in my key ring. It's always with my keys. It goes with me wherever I go. So whenever I want to send a, a private PGP message, I use I use my thumb drive, or if in the in or if it's in the case I'm making it from an iPhone, I have the keys on my iPhone. I always, I always have the iPhone on me or with me at all times, and so it's very hard for somebody to get those keys from me. 
And uh, once I get those keys, I can now communicate with anybody that I have keys for. So if I have your public key, I could send you an encrypted message that only you and me can read. And PGP is very hard to use. It's not an easy program to use. And so uh, a lot of people get turned off by it. Why should I do this? I'm not doing anything illegal. Well, that's the common mindset of the American person today. Oh, I'm a law-abiding a citizen. I go, I go to work at 9, come home at 5. I sit down with a wife and kids and have dinner and watch TV and go to bed at 10 o'clock, wake up the next morning, go to work again. Why am I? I'm not doing anything illegal. Why should I care whether somebody's reading my email or not? All they're going to know about is maybe my recipes or something like that. Well, that may be true, but it's really important for us to realize that when you walk in your, you go in your house at night, you have a key and you use that key to open the door so that you know with, with a reasonable amount of certainty that no one's going to come into your house and ask you because the door is locked. Because normally you keep your door locked at night. When you send mail, snail mail, you'll write a letter with a pencil and a pen, an analog output device. And you put it into this envelope, you seal the envelope, put a stamp on it, address the envelope, give it to the postman, and you have pretty good reasonable expectation. And no one's going to read that letter except the person who gets that mail. Okay, people don't apply that when they're using email. People don't realize email can be just caught right over the wire. You can just catch it, you can snip it, you can get it, get it as a file, you can intercept it, and you can read it. So why don't you keep your email in an envelope? The envelope being PGP. Pretty good privacy. Another thing is key size. The NSA can crack keys that are less than 1024 bytes long. If you keep your keys less than 1024 bytes long, there's high likelihood that the NSA, if given enough time and resources, yes, they can break and crypto analyze that message. They've got the computers and the manpower to do it. If you use 4096-bit keys, You've just amplified that by a factor of 80 or 64, some crazy number like that. So you've got a pretty good expectancy that they're not going to be able to read that mail. And the only way that they can read that mail is if they implant a Trojan in your computer. They gain control of your iPhone or your iPad, which they can do. They can activate the camera on your laptop or on your desktop. They can activate the microphone, and they can listen in on your calls as well as listen in on your room and also watch you get undressed and fuck your girlfriend at night. And it's assuming, of course, your camera is within range. Yeah. They can do all that. Very easy. They could at least hear it. Yeah. And uh, you are also involved in services right now that comfort or complement encryption like Standard Cloud for example, yep. and other stuff. Tell us about that. ThunderCloud is basically a huge computing system in the sky, very, very big processing power, lots and lots of memory. But your connection to that machine is just through a standard desktop like you'd see on your laptop. It works just like a laptop. It's got icons that represent your files. It's got a, a menu bar. It's got all the things that your laptop anyone would have but all those icons and stuff like that are not generated on your laptop. They're generated through the cloud. They're sent down to you through encrypted channels that are very secure, using mostly PGP protocols, and allowing you to be able to, in very securely, very privately, and very fast, by the way, communicate. And then you cross about the border inspector inspecting your computer. Like a lot of people, a lot of reporters now, they'll often they have every right to just open up your laptop and ask you to unlock the, unlock your laptop and ask you to pub, punch in your, your, your login ID and let you look at your computer. They have every right to do that. And if you refuse, they can hold you for 48 hours and inconvenience you terribly. Hmm. However, if you have a thin little laptop that's no bigger than an iPad, thin client with a browser, that you can connect to that browser through a high secure data link. And when you turn the thing on, it asks you to log in or use your thumbprint 
to identify yourself. Right. And of course, they can ask you to log in and you can refuse. But or you can try to log in and say, oh, gee, I forgot the password, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a way of safeguarding your information when you bring it across international borders into countries that are not too, you might say, uh, liberal as far as use of Internet, like China, maybe or certain Asian countries. Right. And this is essentially like a cloud computing thing where where it's almost like a remote remote access where nothing is really on your machine. You access it via this thundercloud. Right, exactly. It could be a thundercloud. So so that way if if they want you to, you know, unlock your computer, if you don't have access to to the internet through, you know, cell or Wi Fi or something, there will be nothing on it for them to yeah, see. That's right. The other security options are already available to the public, but people don't really know about them. I found out here that in Europe, there's not that many people using Wicker. Wicker is very in great use in the USA. It works on all platforms, every single conceivable platform. Linux, Mac, Windows, iPhone, iPad, Android. Works on everything. And you just... Sign in, you register with a username and password, and presto, you can use Wicker by just knowing the username. You can also lock Wicker down to your email address. So if, if Jork, for instance, wants to access me through my email address, then Wicker knows me through my email address. He can send me a message to jdcrunchman at gmail.com, and I'd get a Wicker message. I tried it. It works. <laughs> works quite well, actually. Uh, we all communicate with Wicker. Uh, Wicker works on earlier iOS applications, works on Android, and that's why I got it, because it works on earlier versions of the operating systems. Hmm. A more later version, this version only works on the current version of operating system, but very, very secure and is recommended by Edward Snowden is a program called Signal for the iPhone. It only works on iOS 8.3. And uh, you can uh, use it just like you can use a telephone, only it's not a telephone. It's a very secure, and I bet it's just as secure as a telephone that uh, President Obama uses when he talks to his colonels and generals. Mm. Does that mean that, that if we really want to, everybody of us could be very secure and encrypting every communication that we, we use, but people are generally not, well... And mass surveillance will be a moot point after a certain thing. It won't really matter about mass surveillance anymore because if everybody's using encryption, they can mass surveil all they want. They don't have to do anything but a bunch of jumbled data. If they want to feed that data into their huge, massive computer center in Utah, let them go ahead and do it. And maybe in, maybe in, in 20, 30 years, they might, they might be able to decrypt one or two of the messages. The, 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 the weird thing is that people don't have a like, – like you said, a lot of people don't, don't follow this because it's, it's not necessarily easy or maybe it's not user-friendly or something. And a lot right. of people, they, there seems to be a really a short, a short attention span with this because their – Their attitude sucks. Mm -hmm. Their attitude is this. Why do I need to encrypt my email? I'm not doing anything wrong. Why would the police want to understand what my calls are? I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, that's wrong, and it's the wrong way to think. For the same reason you lock your door at night should be the same reason why you should protect your communications. It's that simple. And to openly put your communications out on an open channel It's just like you going out there on the street and yelling and you're taking your pants down and walking in the street naked or doing something that you would normally do at home but out on the street and let everybody see you. It's the same thing. Right. It's called lewd and malicious intent or whatever it's a crime they give for it. I mean, it's the same thing. But this time, you're using your email and you're using your Gmail and you're doing it in the open. And you're doing it at, internet, at an internet cafe. Shame on you. You know? Right, right. You deserve to have your, your dirty laundry aired to the public. And the, and the government, That's my philosophy on it. Right, right. And in the government, they make, they make uh, um, statements like we're only collecting you know, metadata. We're not looking at the whole messages or we're not looking at people's individual phone conversations. But even 
it, it would seem to me that even just that information, metadata like who I'm is calling, even more. Yeah, metadata is even more dangerous than the actual data. Right. Metadata gives a complete map of who you associate with, who they associate with, your connections between the two people, and they've got programs that figure that stuff out, and they chart it on this big chart in front of them. Say, oh man, this guy's got a whole bunch of lines connected to him. He must be the kingpin. He must be the terrorist. You know what I mean? And so, and so that's how they identify. Uh, certain activities going on. That right, and that's, I think, I think we, we, we mentioned that in, in the very first podcast we did, we, we were talking about uh, security and, and the way that they connect data, and it's almost worse to connect, to just collect that information because, you know, if some, if a terrorist, you know, dials a number wrong and calls me, suddenly there's a, there, there's a connection to me, and they're right, like, exactly. who's this guy? You know, whereas, you know, even if they had the data, they could be like, oh, it was a wrong number or, or whatever. But but just having that information, suddenly you're connected and now suddenly they're looking at you when you didn't necessarily, you know, you just, you know, said, oh, sorry, you know, wrong, you know, I'm not Ahmed or whoever, you know. So, and that's why when people contact me, I ask them, first thing you want to, if you want to contact me, you have to say to yourself, well, I'm contacting the crunch. He's a very watched person. This person is being watched. So if I contact the crunch, I might be on a watch list. Well, that's what Wicker comes in handy for. Mm -hmm. I can give them my Wicker name, and they can contact me on Wicker, and there's no metadata. So there's nothing for them to, to, to latch on to. Since I contacted you via Facebook, it means now I'm doomed. Yes, he's doomed. <laughs> he's expecting a knock on the door next week. <laughs> From the BND, I think they call it, right? Yeah. Bundesnachrichtendienst, BND. Yeah, right. It's the German equivalent of the FBI. Yeah. Well, we've been, we've yeah, been right. watching the Germans for a while. Didn't we tap... Uh, 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 the Prime Minister Merkel. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah, we were yep. checking her out. And, and again, that was one of those things where where I was surprised at the fact that you know we're we were basically tapping her phone. The 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 she's the Chancellor, she's uh, the Chancellor of Germany. We're tapping her phone, and you know that information comes out, and everyone's like, oh, okay. You know, even even Germany didn't get too upset about it, and it's like, how? Well, let is me this... tell you some stories about Germany, which really kind of freaked me out and really <laughs> really took me for a loop. Should I go? <laughs> I was in uh, I was in uh, a, a supermarket store in Berlin, and uh, we were stopping by the store to pick up some food for breakfast in the morning. And I was just wandering around the store, looking at labels of products and stuff. And here I was with my iPhone, and I've got this Google Translation app, which is really cool. You just take a picture of the text and it translates. The yeah, text it does it on the German. screen right, right in real time. It's it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't really work for me very well. At least no. this one didn't. And that security guard comes and says, "No photos, no photos, no photos." And I and I tried to explain to him. Of course, he didn't understand German. I didn't understand German, so I tried to explain to him what's going on. And so another customer heard me arguing with him in English. He come over and interpreted for me and explained it to the guard that I was all I was doing was to just take an image of some text on a on a product label to find out what the hell it is. And the same thing happened in the museum when I went to the communication museum in Berlin. There was a nice description. It was this really cool gadget. I wanted to know what it was in English. There's no English description, so I go snapping pictures. Of course, the museum staff comes jumping on me six ways on Sunday, saying no photos, no photos. But luckily, he spoke enough English to where I tried to explain it to him that I was, I was only just taking the, the signs and translating them into English. And, and actually, a pretty good trick for, for my next travel. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll have to put it to good use when I go to France. Yeah. So, so Jörg, why, why is it, though, that they don't like, like photo taking in Germany? Because German people are very, very adamant about privacy. It comes from the World War II. It comes from way back then, way back when the Gestapo people were harassing people. That's the mindset of the whole group of population in Germany, from what I, get, from what I guess. I'm just saying it from an American perspective. Mm -hmm. Let's hear it from a German perspective. Yeah. You tell me what's going well, on. Well, I've heard it's because they want to sell, you know, pushers and carts with the details on it. So it's for merchandise. They want to sell to the tourists more merchandise products. And this is why you shouldn't take photos yourself. But, well, buy, buy the 
picture postcards from a souvenir souvenir shop. That's at least what I heard. I don't know. I don't know about it. But know? I mean, in a grocery store, you're not gonna. That's true. You're actually. shopping. You're not gonna. There's there's not gonna be a postcard of the grocery store that you can purchase for for keepsake. Maybe maybe of the museum. Maybe in this museum case, it's right. Who mm -hmm. knows? Um, but anyway, it's interesting, John, that you mentioned Facebook because you are kind of working against your own rule because you're not using... really, not really. Because remember, I'm a celebrity. Okay, celebrities have to behave differently than an average Joe person out there on the street. Number one, I can be on Facebook. Okay, I don't have to worry about it too much. You know, other than people maybe being dis making disrespected posts, there's lots of those. Anyway, I don't give a, I don't care about that. But what I care about is, is hey, I can go on Facebook. I can let people know where I'm at. And that's a good thing for me. It might not be good for you because you want to protect your privacy. You've got your own private life to deal with. You, don't want, you want the government to completely stay out of your face. But for me, they already know about me. And the more they know about me, the better off it is for me because then they're going to leave me alone. They're going to know that I go to the gym on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays to work out. They know that. And they know that I go to the therapy classes. They know I go to my doctor's office. They know that I go to the pharmacy. They know I go to the supermarket. They know that I always stop at a supermarket after I get back from the gym. And they can follow me all they want to. they got a complete map of where I am, and that's just fine with me. But is that fine with you? Probably not. <laughs> I guess it all comes and down also to celebrities. Celebrities are tweeting incorrectly, and they tweet themselves into the foot. I mean, they do really crazy stuff, and they tweet. And when they tweet, they can really get screwy, <laughs> and they can screw themselves big time. And I'm not just talking about one or two celebs. I'm talking about a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful when using social networkings. But social networking can itself be a really interesting tool for, uh, for both uh, including broadcast media, social media, and there was a mix between broadcast media, social media, and it was on a sci-fi channel of all things, which normally just specializes in sci-fi programs. It has this thing called Opposite Worlds. I mean, go find it on YouTube. I'm sure you'll find a few episodes up there. But it's, uh, it's a really good... Uh, a really good example of how they use regular broadcast media with social media. And they use Twitter, they use Facebook, they, they get the people who watch it to participate into the program, to pick who your favorite player is, who your favorite person is, and why they should not win or why they should not be chosen. Hmm. And even the TV program Survivor often I will will ask for audience participation in certain things, but not on the air. They would only do it through Twitter, only do it through their Facebook page. I guess it all comes down to really what you know, what you want people to know about yourself, and and in certain things, you know, like I I have a Facebook page. I don't put very much on it uh, regarding my personal life. I'll put stuff on there, you know, I'll have pictures of my dogs or something. But for the most exactly. part, you know, I, I don't mention where I'm going or what I'm doing usually. Yeah, and, and you just keep a close circle of friends, maybe 10 right. or 15, and that's it. And these people are your friends. You know who they are, and you could share your pictures with them. That was Facebook. That was what Facebook was originally designed for. Mm -hmm. then, they, then, the, then the kids would go whole hog at it. They'll add anybody as a friend. They'll want everybody to know about their pictures in, in their high school prom or whatever. Mm -hmm. They want to know that they were doing this sport and that the, and this guy can do the more pull-ups than anybody else or something in sports or something. Because then they give, them a, an adver they give them a thing that they can brag about. You know, it's bragging rights. And that's right. what they use Facebook for, bragging rights. Mm -hmm. Let's have a new goal. Let's hit the 5,000 friends limit on Facebook. <laughs> kind Even of. I haven't reached that limit yet. <laughs> well, maybe maybe when people are listening to this soon, when we publish this, who knows? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a little bit more, a uh, little bit more careful about who I select as friends. Usually, the way I do it is I'll pick like one or two days a month where I go through my friend request list. I'll go through their the list. I I go through their pages and I look at their pictures, look at where they're from, and get uh, whatever they want to share with me. Of course, ah. Oh, this is an interesting guy. He does this. He's the university. He's a programmer. I might need to talk to him someday. So I'll add him as a friend. 
Mm-hmm. And so I've got maybe close to 2,000 or 3,000 friends. I've got nowhere near 5,000 friends. But I'm also very, very careful about who I pick as my friends, too. Right. But at the same time, I let, I let them grow. And I've, never had, I've only had to befriend maybe two or three people. That was it. Wow. Hmm. And it was very rarely that I would defriend anybody. Once they become my friend, then they, then they, I get to share my wall with them. <laughs> and I always go, I could take pictures of Stockholm and share them with friends and yeah. stuff like that. We had some pretty nice time here in, in, in Mannheim. Yesterday was a warm, sunny day. So you really like traveling a lot and see your fans. Well, sort of, kind of with my physical Uh, inability these days. It's sort of like a little hardship on me these days. I have uh, had surgery and the surgery kind of wiped me out physically. I've got four screws in my spine. Mm. So, and that can be really nasty, especially when there's cold there around. Right. Had a hell of a time in Stockholm. It's cold. (laughs) And being snatched from the hot desert in Nevada into the cold, windy, cloudy days in Stockholm we were only 400 miles from the Arctic Circle, you can tend to get a little bit cold. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. I, I like how Wikipedia... The air up there was so amazingly fresh. My God, the air was just crazy. So fresh <laughs> and nice. It's a nice place to be if you don't like pollution. Right. I, I like how Wikipedia, you know, they, they describe you as having, as being a nomad, maintaining a nomadic lifestyle. I've always had a nomadic lifestyle, even when I was a nine-to-five job. Come Friday evening at five o'clock, I'd be in my van already on my way up to the mountains and live in my van and drive around in all these different Seattle, Sierra Nevada towns, going from town to town, meeting some Hells Angels, meeting some local people, hanging out, just going from place to place. That's what I did on weekends, hmm. every day, every weekend. And then I'd, and I'd get back home just, just in time for work. And I have my car already packed with the camping, camping gear, equipment, whatever, ham radio stuff, all ready to go. The minute I cut off from work, I just make a beeline to the mountains. That's usually where I'd be romping around, staying, hanging out in places like Twain Heart, Sonora, Pinecrest Lake, uh, up in Kennedy Meadows, up in the way, in the high elevations, we're talking like six, 7,000 feet. It's really crisp and cool and clear up there. So we we talked about your traveling. We talked about thundercloud and your wrestling um, phone freaking thing. So what else are you doing right now at the moment? I'm just doing some very light contracting work for a company called Golden Spear. They're basically a search engine, and uh, they're using natural language processing to process a search string into making meaningful words. They can then utilize this, this engine, going through a database of all these words and being able to put these words together and create hits based on what you're really looking for, not just what you think you're looking for, but what you're really looking for based on words from natural language. You can type it in French, Spanish, German, English, whatever. It'll know to break those words up into adjectives, and, they, and it's available in multiple languages. And uh, then you can use that information for doing things like like analysis and stuff. Another interesting part of your history is actually you wrote Easy Rider, right? Well, actually, yeah. he, he did quite a bit. Um, you, you've done quite a bit for um, – you wrote the cross assembler that uh, was used with the original Apple One and Two. To to uh right, to yeah. program that, so you're kind of partially responsible for for that even existing. Well, Steve Wozniak used the cross assembler, but it wasn't mine; it was someone else's. Oh, really? That generated the yeah. I didn't do the sixty five hundred two. Randy Wigginton did that. I did the sixty eight hundred. Mm. I did the S eight, and I did the eighty eighty. And the Randy did the sixty five hundred two. And you wrote you wrote uh, the fourth language i think which no actually steve wozniak you know that red book that first came out on the apple right the listing in that red book was the listing from the 6502 cross assembler oh, okay okay and and you did uh you did easy writer and if i recall i did that it... in fourth on an apple too in fact when i was in stockholm just a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. my friend that i was with had a game and he likes to have these games he's a, he's definitely a uh, what you would call it a demo guy. 
right? A demo? demo? Demo scene guy, yeah. 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 And he, uh... Yeah, Andreas Wallström. I actually know him. Oh, really? Yeah. And so we found an Easy Rider for the Apple II on the Apple II emulator, and we loaded it into the Apple II emulator, and it worked. <laughs> and then we got the manual off the web, too. Really? Yeah. We actually used... The original Easy Rider was still there. We used Easy Rider in my, uh, in my elementary school. We used Easy Rider on, on the Apple IIs. Yeah. We used that, and I think it was Bank Street Rider was the other one we used, but, but Easy Rider was one of the, the, the software that we used in school when this was first coming out. It was really easy to use. It didn't... I mean, Apple IIs are really cheap, mm -hmm. and uh, even though an Apple II only had uppercase... Uh, if it was showing up on the screen as inverse video, it yep. would be capitalized, and the rest of the characters were lowercase. Yeah, I remember that. Mm. Yeah, that's better. You see, interview with food included. Yeah, yeah, I just, went, I just went and got some ice cream. <laughs> and you're eating some kind of pastry, it looks like. Croissant. Nah. French. Yes. Well, France is next on his trip, right? Next week. Next week, so you're still you're still kind of uh, living the nomadic lifestyle, just uh, going much further. Yeah, in the early part of the year, I was in Asia getting stem cell treatments. Oh, those were pretty gross, but it was it worked pretty well actually. Hmm. When it healed my hips and knees, and then I just go wipe out my knees two days ago. <laughs> All right, um, so let's talk about uh, future plans actually. Do you have any future plans after traveling, what you want to do? Probably do more work at Golden Spear. Because by that time, they'll be probably pretty much ready to go online. Hmm. And then when they go online, there'll be a lot of work involved in testing and getting things working and fixing bugs. So you'll be taking a much more active role in, in the development at that point. Well, mostly testing and fixing bugs and getting things to work right. Mm. A lot of the original work is being done. So the reason I'm going down to Spain is to meet with a Spanish group. Okay. The other one's doing most of the work on the search engine. Hmm. So that's cool. You, you've you been one of the pioneers that really got the home computer, the home computer market going. I mean, you know, again, like I said, without, you know, the... the these, I mean, these for all computers, you would just get programs. You'd have to write your own programs. Right, right. Which is how it used to used to be with a lot of this stuff. We do um, uh, Commodore sixty four disk mag, and it, it's uh, a lot of the older ones used to be just a magazine that came with uh, with programs, and that you would type in off the off the pages. Yeah, that's what I did. I took the IEEE journals, electrical engineering journals, and then all these programs in basic for engineering work. Mm -hmm. And I used them to calculate all kinds of really cool things. Yeah. I did a program for calculating the right parts to use for certain filters. Um, yeah, I wanted to say, you also did like the telephone interface for the yeah, Apple II? Apple II, yeah, the, the, the phone board. The, called the Charlie board. Yeah, the Charlie board. But that wasn't, did that ever go into production or? Oh, no. No. No, Steve Jobs didn't want to see that thing. Then, no, the phone company didn't want that thing to see the light of day. Hmm. It had what they called "quote Ill, uh, illegal thoughts" unquote. <laughs> illegal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Wow, that 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 sounds kind of a lot like the uh, constant surveillance now, you know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so I wanted to say. I see you a lot on stage giving talks and actually sharing your knowledge with young people and interested people. And um, so so what is your next talk? What's your next speech going to be about? Um, I'm going to be still focusing on privacy and security because that is probably one of the most uh, number one issues today in relationship to what our hero did back two years ago. Hmm. The guy who lived in Hawaii that took a little side trip to Hong Kong. Yes, yes. 
that guy. And, and that's and that's something that really really gets me too is that he's still, I mean the the man is still doing stuff and he's still the information is still being released and nobody is paying any attention to it anymore and it, I don't I don't understand. It seems like such a actually a, they are they are because the the Justice Department deemed it illegal for mass surveillance. Hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, for phone. Phone calls in the United States, and they deemed it illegal because Snowden brought it out to the public, and now they're and now they're voting on on the new FISA Act or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then Paul Rand, Republican president, nominate not the, the the nomination the president candidate right has been did a filibuster to basically tie up Congress so Congress wouldn't pass it because they had to they had until June first to do that and they and they they just kept it tied up because he deliberately tied it up so it would the deadline would pass. Once mm-hmm. the deadline got passed, then they couldn't do anything about it. Right. Which is a smart, brilliant move on his part. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a cool thing that he did. Because that was the only way that you could do it. Because they had, they were all ready to pass it. I mean, it was really close. Mm-hmm. And now they're rethinking it again. They're trying to make new laws about the whole bullshit. Now, who knows what's going on? Yeah, I'm sure that they'll find a way to uh, to continue. Well, I'm sure of that. I just Let's discovered go. about these. Um, there's cameras, and I always assumed that they were red light cameras or or whatever. And I just found out that they are. Um, they collect license plates of cars so they can. Follow, uh, they also do facial recognition, especially in, in Nevada. Really? In my Nevada driver's license, I had to take my glasses off because it would fuck up the facial recognition software. Huh. Oh, that was pretty cool. So where do you think we're going as far as privacy? Do you think it's getting – do you think the well, average think person is, is people getting – People are definitely becoming more aware of it. And obviously the terrorists have now definitely become more aware of it. And they, have to, they have to change the way they do things. Right. So everybody has to change the way they do things, which is a good thing in a way. Not good in the sense that terrorists are changing their ways, but good in the sense that, uh, that uh, other people are starting to realize that, hey, we could protect our privacy here. Let's do it, you know? Right. There are technical ways of getting around NAFs surveillance. It's real simple. Encrypt all your mail. Encrypt all your phone calls. Use programs like, uh, like, um, like WhatsApp. Not WhatsApp. I mean, that's good too. But use programs like, uh, like Signal and the Red Phone and those programs. Start using those programs more and more. You'll become much, much more secure and much more private. And that's the key. And people need to realize that, but they're not. They're not realizing that. But more and more leaks are coming out. I can assure you, they're going to continue for many, many years. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, the, the, the wealth. I mean, the, he had a huge amount of information that, yeah. that he took with him, and some of this is is the uh, cat's out of the bag. Yeah, that's all I would say. Yeah, no more. But now it's up to the individual to really take it upon themselves to. Make sure that what they're doing is is secure and and to, I I, I guess that the point is that that people have to really get it and and understand that the privacy is really in their hands rather than yeah exactly it should be up to the individual as to whether or not they want to protect their privacy or not not the government right it's none of their fucking business <laughs> all right yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna move. I wanna I'm trying to get it. All right. Put this away. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well well I I get we um we covered it. Okay, so that was uh John Draper, the the Captain Crunch. So you can you can follow him. Uh you can check out his webpage at webcrunchers dot com. Um and check out Thundercloud, which we were just talking about before, uh at thundercloudservices dot com. Uh you can also check out his, his uh Twitter at JD Crunchman and look him up on Facebook and, and so forth because he has not hit the Facebook friends limit. You can check us out. Um, sceneworld.org is our site. 
And you can check out the podcast, the disc issues, um, the interviews, all kinds of fun stuff on there. You can also email us, podcast at sceneworld.org. Yes, and don't forget to check us out on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash sceneworld. And, um, and our YouTube po- channel, our YouTube channel, youtube.sceneworld.org. Exactly. Yeah, check that and out. And subscribe to our YouTube channel because it's brand new and it's still missing subscribers. York has a site, it's nafcom.eu. Yes, and AJ has a site, justwestofhell.com. That's what it is, and it hasn't been updated in Lord knows how long, but it's there. Neither mine, but we will do that. And we should, we should uh, mention that the live Twitch show with me will be on twitch.tv slash olimtronica and it will be in English. Ooh. My interview with Chris Sulzbeck will be in English. So. so when will that be? What day is that on? The 24th of June, the last Wednesday in every month. Okay. It will start at 6 p.m. Central European Summertime. Which is some other time in America. Yep. But you can check that out at at um, worldtimeserver.com yeah. if you like. Yeah. And there is a meeting planner and there you can check out when we have to meet on Twitch TV according to your time zone. That's right. And check out our Twitch channel which will be doing things shortly. So twitch.tv slash sceneworld. Yeah. Twitch.tv slash sceneworld. Yeah. And um, yeah. Uh, till next time, I'm AJ. You're just sitting right there. Yep. I'm here watching at HA. Okay. Well, I will see you. We will see you next time. See you next time.